Hey guys, welcome to Tidal Gardens. It's time for another coral spotlight. This video is all about a group of bottom dwellers affectionately called plate corals. Now the term plate corals refers to a collection of several different corals from the family Fungiidae. In the hobby, the most commonly seen varieties are Fungia, Heliofungia, Diaceris, Cycloceris, and Lithophyllin. In all, there is around 13 different genera that make up the family Fungiidae. These corals are flat, solitary corals, sometimes with a single mouth while others have multiple mouths. Most of them take on a circular shape, however, there are some varieties that take on more irregular shapes, such as tongue corals that have an elongated form. For the most part, I lump all of these corals together because they can be a little bit confusing to tell apart. Sure, there's some big differences between some of them. In fact, lithophyllin for a long time was considered a chalice coral, so clearly someone thought that it looked different than the rest of these plate corals. On the other hand, some genera are close in appearance and challenging to differentiate. For example, I can't easily tell the difference between Cycloceris fungia and Dana fungia based on the pictures that I just see online. Also, the aforementioned tongue corals are included in this family and there are a few different genera of tongue corals and I can't really pick those out of a lineup. For example, Stenactis and Purpolitha. They pretty much look the same to me. Confusing the situation a little more is the fact that taxonomy is fluid and coral classification changes as new discoveries are made. Corals get bounced from category to category and it takes years for the reef aquarium industry to adopt the latest nomenclature if it ever happens. As for care requirements, plate corals are pretty similar. Overall, I would say that plate corals are easy large polyp stony corals to keep, and they can adapt to a wide variety of tank conditions. The only one that I personally avoid is heliofungia or long tentacle plate coral. They look amazing in that they have this anemone-like appearance and grow to impressive sizes, but unfortunately they have this long history of just crashing. The only time that I ever get them was when a wholesaler didn't have a particular coal that I wanted and they just filled in the order with some heliofungia. They did great for a few months, but then one day they just simply die overnight. There may be hobbyists with more success with them these days, with more feeding options for corals, but personally, I don't exactly have a big appetite to try them again. Okay, let's talk about care requirement specifics. We should first address where to place these corals. Quick answer is the bottom of your tank, but in reality you don't really have a whole lot of say in the matter. Plate corals are one of the few stony corals that are capable of inflating their flesh and moving around on their own. Oftentimes, attempts to keep them on the rockscape go really poorly because they are very capable jumpers and will find their way down to the substrate in no time. As an aside, we like to set up these guys on little posts for photography and we always have to play this game where we give them just enough time to recover from us placing them in the photography tank, but not too much time that they would eventually just hop off of those little stands. My recommendation is to go ahead and start them off right on the substrate and let them scoot around until they find a spot that they're happy with. They may perpetually move around the substrate, so don't expect them to eventually stop. Given their ability to move short distances, provide them with plenty of room away from other corals on the substrate that they may touch. Plate corals are not the most aggressive things in the world, but they can do battle with other corals that they come in contact with. You really want to avoid aggression issues whenever possible. One question that I get a lot of is what type of substrate to have in a tank for these guys. And this one is a little bit tricky. If I had to recommend anything, it would be crushed coral that is medium to chunky grain, but definitely not sugar powder fine sand. I've kept these corals on very fine substrates before, and it's just not the best. Similarly, I don't like keeping them on a bare bottom tank if at all possible. Now this is purely anecdotal experience, but Sometimes they get this dead spot on their flesh and it causes an infection. And this seems to happen more in these types of fine substrates. But again, your mileage may vary. 
One other observation that I can provide regarding substrate is that I've seen these corals diving in the Pacific, and usually they're on very rocky terrain. Similarly, when I've seen them in public aquariums, they're almost kept exclusively on rough, thumb-sized gravel substrates. Just something to think about there. Lighting. When it comes to lighting plate corals, they're not altogether too demanding. They do well in a wide range of intensities, even fairly low light around 50 par. So even in brightly illuminated aquariums, the light that they would receive is kind of muted because corals towards the bottom of the tank don't get as much light as corals towards the top of the tank. And this difference is accentuated because of the inverse square law. As you move a coral further away from a light source, the intensity is divided by the square of the distance. So if you're moving a coral twice as far away from a light source, it cuts down the light to one quarter, not one half. The light intensity a plate coral receives is further cut down by any cloudiness or opacity in the water, or even shading from rock overhangs and coral colonies above it. Some plate corals have very bright fluorescence, making them spectacular showpieces under full actinic lighting. For these particularly bright specimens, I like to provide the aquarium with a couple hours of blue light to enjoy this aesthetic in the evenings. As for water flow, plate corals will do fine in medium to low flow. I try to keep them out of high flow areas for two reasons. First, many varieties of plate corals are fleshy and too much flow can damage them. If you see the water flow exerting a lot of pressure on one side of the plate coral to the point where you can start to see the flesh drawn in tight to the skeleton, it's probably too much flow. One thing to note is that the flow at the bottom of the tank where the glass meets the substrate can be an area of stronger flow as the water hits the glass and whips right around to the bottom at that location. Just be aware of that in case one of these corals creeps over to the side of the tank. It might be getting too much. Let's now briefly touch on water chemistry. Plate corals are stony corals, and they need a consistent supply of calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium in the water to facilitate their skeletal growth. I try to keep each of these parameters in line with natural seawater levels and maintain consistent numbers. So for calcium, shoot for around 425 parts per million. For alkalinity, right around 8 dKH. And for magnesium, around 1350 parts per million. Consistency of water chemistry is more important to me than the raw numbers. So if you see that one of these parameters is lagging behind or elevated, don't be in a huge rush to change the water chemistry. Slowly correcting the figures over time is a lot less stressful on your corals than current water chemistry that's not quite in line with your goals. The next chemical parameter I'll talk about here is nitrate. Certain large polyp stony corals seem to be more sensitive to nitrate than others, and I've lost a plate coral here and there suddenly when my nitrate is too high. Now, it may be coincidence or the cause of some damage in handling getting to me, but I don't have the same sort of problem in the systems with lower nitrate levels. If you're struggling with keeping these corals, it may be wise to double check your nitrate levels and see if they're just getting too high. Anything over 30 parts per million nitrate might be an issue, and I like to try to keep the nitrate levels between 5 and 20 parts per million. Corals can adapt to high nitrates over time, but most of the problems that we're seeing is a new coral being brought into a high nitrate environment and then failing to adjust. Lastly, if you struggled to keep plate corals in the past, it's good to check to see if phosphate levels in the aquarium were too high. Phosphate is needed by corals in small quantities, but an abundance of phosphate can lead to unwanted nuisances such as algae. The other problem with phosphate is that it can inhibit the calcium uptake in stony corals. Having said that, many aquarists have been very successful adapting corals to aquariums with high phosphate, but it's not optimal. And if there is a coral struggling in a high phosphate environment, this is one area that could be the culprit. Here at Tidal Gardens, we've kept corals in systems that had over 2 parts per million phosphate, which is insanely high. But we've also kept them in systems where the phosphate was under 0.05 parts per million. Having experienced the two, I'd like the results with the lower phosphate levels better. 
Plate corals are photosynthetic, so they get nutrients from the products of photosynthesis carried out by symbiotic zooxanthellae living in their flesh. In addition to photosynthesis, these corals are adept feeders that can grab and consume a wide range of foods such as coral-specific sinking pellets and frozen food such as brine shrimp, mysis shrimp, and krill. Despite their appetite, there are two things to watch out for if you're looking to feed these corals. The first concern is overfeeding. I've seen some of these corals react poorly if they're fed large quantities every day. I think they like a little bit of time to expel waste from the previous day, so here we don't feed them more than three times per week. I don't know if other aquarists have experienced the same sort of thing, but for us, we like to play it safe and give them plenty of time between feedings. The second concern with feeding is that certain fish and inverts, such as shrimps, crabs, they can treat these corals like vending machines when they learn that they're constantly full of food. I love cleaner shrimps and peppermint shrimp for their utility, but as they get larger and more boisterous, they can really mess with corals that are fed heavily and just go in there and rip apart their mouths. In your tank, you might want to pay attention to this dynamic. I love feeding corals and I definitely think that they benefit from it, but it can't come at the cost of severe damage from their tank mates. Another option when it comes to feeding that may be effective without risking quite so much damage from tank mates is amino acids. I'm hearing more and more aquarists make a concoction of amino acids and really fine plankton powders to spot feed corals. This may be a great way to supplement the plate coral's nutrition with minimal risk of damage. When it comes to propagation, plate corals are a mixed bag that depends a lot on which genus that we're talking about. Some can be broken into pieces and recover, while others just can't. Some varieties are so resilient, in fact, that they can experience major dieback from a stress event, and months later, the remaining tiny bits of flesh will grow back into mini colonies called anthocoli. Plate corals are also capable of sexual reproduction as well as budding, so they really have a lot of tools in their reproductive kit. Their growth rates are all across the board as well. There are some varieties of plate corals that are extremely slow growing, while others we've seen grow from the size of a small coin to a full 8 inch diameter plate over the course of a year. The only varieties that we actively propagate here at Tidal Gardens are tongue corals and diaceras plate corals that heal very well from cutting. My favorites being a sky blue tongue coral and a bright red diaceras plate. So what type of aquariums are plate corals great for? These corals are a diverse bunch and can make their way into both an LPS dominated tank with medium to low light corals or a mixed reef with highlight corals like Acropora because towards the bottom of the tank, plate corals are less likely to receive too, too much light. All right, I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you'd like more information or perhaps purchase a plate coral for your aquarium, I invite you to visit us at tidalgardens.com and see what we have in stock. That pretty much does it for this video. Please leave a like on your way out for the algorithm. And until next time, happy reefing.